A portmanteau is a linguistic blend of words that are combined to make a new word, and that new word is relevant to both of the words that are involved in the blending. Wikipedia clarifies by saying that don't is a contraction, as it melds two words that would otherwise appear in order in a sentence, do and not, don't, while starfish is a compound word because it combines two words without losing anything from either word, star and fish. If we were to make a portmanteau of star and fish, we might end up with something like stish. The word portmanteau was actually coined in this context by Lewis Carroll in his book Through the Looking Glass. It was already a word in common use, but it referred to a suitcase that, when opened, contained two equal sections. So while the usage back then was a piece of luggage that contained two sections, Carroll reworked it to apply to two words being combined into a new, more easily carried word. If you read his work, you will see that he makes use of a lot of these portmanteaus. Some portmanteaus have become so widely used that we barely recognize them as such. Eurasia, for instance, and infomercial have become part of the common lexicon. We also do this when referring to pop culture, Brangelina and Benefer, for example, to describe famous celebrity couples, and when we name companies like Microsoft, which is a portmanteau of microcomputer and software, Amtrak, which is the portmanteau of America and track, as in train track, and Verizon which is a portmanteau of the Latin word veritas, which means truth and horizon. And these have also come into common usage and are seldom thought of in their original portmanteau context. This isn't an English-only concept. We also see it in languages as varied as Arabic, Bulgarian, Chinese, Filipino, French, Galician, German, Modern Hebrew, Hindi, Icelandic, Indonesian, Japanese, Spanish, Tibetan. I want to start the larger conversation today with a product that has a portmanteau name. And this product is at the center of some pretty big ideas and conflicts. Today, we are going to discuss the thin line between opposing ideologies, between ideas like democracy and autocracy, between freedom and restriction. But to get us started, we are going to talk about the burkini. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. This episode of Let's Know Things is brought to you by Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT, You will get a free month's trial of Audible and a free audiobook of your choice. Stick around till the end of the episode and I will give a book recommendation that you could spend that credit on if you care to. This episode is also brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is the hosting company that I have very gladly used for many years for all of my online projects. If you go to hostgator.com slash LKT, They will hook you up with a special discount for Let's Know Things listeners. In this episode, and every episode is also supported by you, the listener. Thank you so very much to everybody who is contributing either directly, monetarily, or by sharing the podcast with their friends or their social networks, by leaving reviews on iTunes. If you are keen to contribute in some way, in whatever way makes sense for you, You can pop by letsknowthings.com, scroll down a little bit, and you will find a bunch of different options. Whatever the case may be, thank you very much for listening. Let's get back to the show.
The article that I want to unspool today comes from The Guardian, and it's entitled, French Police Make Woman Remove Clothing on Nice Beach Following Burkini Ban. And so now that we know all about portmanteaus, you'll probably recognize that burkini is a portmanteau of burka and bikini. And this is an article of clothing that was designed by an Australian Muslim woman for Muslim women. She also designed, before the burkini, an article of clothing called the hijoud, which is a hijab hood that allows Muslim women to more easily play sports while still covering themselves as appropriate for their faith. And this designer, she's sold over 700,000 burkinis since they were first released in 2008. So this isn't a niche product. It is something that has proven to be quite popular. And so what happens in this article? You'll know the full story if you read it, but in brief, the French police made a Muslim woman who was wearing a burkini at the beach take it off. And they gave her a ticket saying that she wasn't, quote, wearing an outfit respecting good morals and secularism, unquote. Now, this happened a month after an attack at the same location, during which a Muslim man drove a truck through a crowd of people celebrating Bastille Day. 86 people were killed in that attack. And it is worth noting that there was a ban on the burkini imposed in Nice on that beach and on many other beaches and resorts. And several other women were also issued tickets for about $42 apiece as a result of that, as a result of defying either knowingly or unknowingly this ban. There is a lot to unpack here. First, let's address the conflict between Islam and governments around the world. This is something that looks different everywhere you go. It's a very different situation in Europe than in the United States, for instance. And it's even more different in places like Indonesia and the Philippines, Afghanistan, and so on. I think it's important to note from the get-go, because this isn't something that I think is said explicitly enough in a lot of cases, but there's a difference between people who adhere to the Muslim faith and people who adhere to the Muslim faith and use it as a justification to hurt and kill people. Is there a chance that this faith is part of what led them to be the way that they are? Of course, yeah. But can the same be said of many other faiths, including those in non-religious entities like the state or a company, as opposed to faith and religion. Yeah, to a greater or lesser degree, and to greater or lesser degrees over the ages for different groups, absolutely. And so at the end of the day, the vast majority of Muslim people are not killing people and never would. The idea that this belief system, above and beyond all others, is unique in its ability to sway people to do things is a fallacy. It's simply not backed up by the data, by the facts of the situation. It's worth remembering that the vast, vast majority of the victims of terrorists and militants who are Muslims are other Muslims. Now, does this mean that there isn't a problem with militant Islam? No, and I think most Muslim people would agree with me on that. This is an issue endemic to some places and to some specific alleyways of the faith, specific deviations and interpretations of it, just as it's at times been an issue for adherence to other religions, to atheists with certain outlooks on the world or political leanings, and so on. And so we can use Muslim terrorist, capital M, capital T, as a demographic to understand how this group of people behave and how to stop potential future terrorist events from happening. But it is important that we distinguish and that we recognize this without lumping everyone who shares a similar trait into that same heinous group. To generalize, 
particularly within societies that pride themselves in being free and promoting freedom, is to be forced away from that freedom by the very people who hope to force us from it. So be careful that you don't do these monsters' jobs for them and clamp down on an otherwise free culture, making it less free, in an effort to try to preserve that freedom. Second, it's important to understand that this comes in the wake of a series of Islam-linked terrorist attacks in the area. Fear very often short-circuits our rational thinking processes and causes us to act instinctually and not think as far ahead as we usually would. Terrorism is named the way that it is because contrary to typical military action, it's not generally intended to destroy a tactically significant enemy target. It's intended to cause terror amongst the populace, which in turn leads them to make reflexive, short-sighted decisions. Again, not ideal, and very often our reflexive, angry, fear responses are what accomplish the ends that these attackers hope to achieve. It's not the terror act itself that does it, it's the response to it. This is what causes freedom-loving groups of people to instinctively tear away freedoms from their own people, from their peers, from themselves. For example, terrorism can make a group of people feel that it makes sense that in order to defend freedom, they have to take away the freedom of dressing however one likes. Now, third, it's also important to recognize that there will be times when one person's freedom runs up against the greater needs of a society so that the larger whole can enjoy their larger collection of freedoms. For instance, the law says you cannot wander around town shooting people. As such, a truly repugnant person who gets their kicks that way has had their freedoms restricted. They are not able to kill whomever they like, because restricting that freedom of theirs allows the larger population to be free to go about their day not worrying that they are going to be killed by a psychopath in the street. Likewise, your freedom to smoke a cigarette in a restaurant might be restricted so that a larger group of people have the freedom to eat out in public without worrying about getting lung cancer from your cloud of smoke. The creation of freedom, then, very often is predicated on limitation. And it's determined by a sort of utilitarian formula that aims to provide the most freedom to the most people possible. But because there are so many people with so many needs, it will never land perfectly, squarely over everybody, covering everyone's every need. All of us, no doubt, have some freedom that is curtailed in the interest of providing a larger number of freedoms or a collection of freedoms that are considered to be more foundational to more people. This in mind, I would argue that it makes perfect sense to, say, restrict the covering of one's face inside a bank. Yes, this will be an inconvenience to some people who wish to cover their faces for whatever reason. But allowing people to do so in certain situations can be an immense security concern that would in some cases help masked felons rob with impunity. And denying people the freedom to cover their faces in, like, a bank helps alleviate the fears that many bankgoers would no doubt feel if a clown-masked individual loitered around with their hands in their pockets while those other people are trying to take their money from their accounts. The priorities here may be different in different societies. Growing up where I grew up, I think the relative greater safety of people in banks is more important than covering one's face. Other people from other parts of the world who believe different things and put more stock in different rituals or different articles of clothing or different ideals of how one presents oneself to the world, 
how one exposes oneself to the world or not, might have different priorities. They might decide that the risk of having someone covering their face as a bank is a risk worth taking. It is a trade-off worth making. Having other people's freedom to feel that they can identify every other person at the bank curtailed is a worthwhile sacrifice so that they can have the freedom to cover their face. And according to their worldview, their beliefs in this matter may be completely rational based on the values that they hold. It may be absolutely vital to their psychological well-being to be able to cover their faces wherever they go. And that, then, informs what freedom looks like to them. So all that in mind, what is happening in this article? One take would be that the French are lashing out as part of a larger fear and or anger response after being attacked by Muslims. The fact that their response is also affecting nonviolent Muslims wouldn't matter to some, whether because they fail to make that distinction or because they just want revenge or protection. They want to feel that they balance the books in some way, some metaphysical way, regardless of who they get to that revenge on, regardless of who they hurt, so long as it's not people that they consider to be their people. Another take would be that this is the consequence of the French government deciding to curtail some freedoms so that a larger group of people will feel more free. Like a mask-wearing person in an airport or bank, it may be that they feel restricting certain body coverings in public spaces would allow more locals to feel more free to enjoy public spaces without fear. Most likely, to me at least, is that it's a little of both plus something extra. We are seeing a wave of anti-immigrant sentiment around the world, but particularly in the US and Europe. And as big a surge as it seems like we've gotten here in the US, in Europe, the impact of that surging immigration of people fleeing the conflicts in the Middle East, and that immigration coming through legal and illegal channels has resulted in a pushback, a feeling of us first, them, maybe never politicking in some very surprising places. And this is an issue that also has a few important facets to it. First, there are some people who are most concerned about keeping their people, their culture, pure. Keeping those who look or act differently, or who speak different languages and eat different foods, out. That is their priority. And they will do what they can to help support those ends. There's another movement that is similar, but different, and which in some places encompasses a much larger portion of the population. It involves a, a larger percentage of people than those who would identify as purists in terms of culture or race or whatnot. This is a group of people who feel empathy for the immigrants and don't have any particular disdain for those who are different, but who want to keep their culture and their city and their society a certain way. We're seeing a lot of this in places like Denmark and other Scandinavian countries, where the locals tend to be friendly and the society quite open, but these are places in which their population is changing swiftly, as immigrants, and particularly immigrants from the Middle East, take up residence. Again, these are not people who feel any particular base-level racial antagonism against the newcomers, but they do resent that those who have just arrived fail to take up the local norms very often. Norms like respecting one's neighbor's preferences, not proselytizing one's religion, not applying restrictions on one's children or wife. These are cultures that have very small populations typically. And so when a large group of immigrants come in, that suddenly becomes a significant percentage of their overall population. And these are countries that have typically 
been largely secular and where they have had more what we would call in the U.S. socialistic tendencies, social programs and such, and have focused for a very long time on a sort of egalitarian approach to society. And that represents equality for everyone, including men, women, children, everybody. It's ironic, I know, that a group of people would resent another group of people for failing to adhere to ideals that revolve around allowing their neighbors the freedom to be how they will be. It, it's an idea that's in conflict to the very idea they don't want to lose. And yet, to many of them, they fear that their specific flavor of freedom will be lost if too many people come to their country, settle in, and start to demand the locals adhere to their norms instead of the norms that were there before. A Danish local from a recent New York Times piece put it pretty starkly. He said, quote, I've become a racist as a result of the influx of new immigrants. This is a group of people who wants to maintain their freedoms and wants other people to have freedoms too, I think. Just from what I know about these cultures and having visited, they, they do tend to be quite open. But the fear that they have is that the freedoms that the newcomers want to have would in turn restrict their freedoms. And so it's a matter of whose freedoms are being restricted to allow the others to flourish. And so that combined with all of the other issues that are emerging, the racial conflict and in terms of the cultural conflicts and in terms of the economic conflicts as well, it's just added fuel to the flame. And so there's almost always a thin line between freedom and limitation. To allow one person's freedoms, you typically have to restrict someone else's. To allow me the freedom to carry a gun in public, you restrict someone else's freedom, or impugn upon someone else's freedom, to not feel threatened by a man with a gun when they're eating at Denny's. And there's one solution that I've often thought about in the past when, when thinking about this conflict. And it always seemed legit to me, but then I started thinking about it and realized that, unfortunately, it doesn't work as well as I thought it might. The idea is that everyone should be free to live however they like, but not free to impose their will on anybody else. But unfortunately, this runs up against freedoms that rely on others or rely on societal norms. For instance, the freedom to not be exposed to ideas you don't agree with or consider to be moral. That is something that requires the active participation of society and of educational institutions in order for you to have that freedom. Or the freedom to not feel threatened by a man with a gun at Denny's. If you want to have the freedom to feel safe and secure in public places, that is directly running up against someone else's freedom to carry a gun. And so we end up with a conflict here where you cannot have it both ways. It's a zero-sum game. And then even more confounding in a way, because it seems even more unsolvable in some ways. And it's a very difficult thing to talk about. But what about the freedom to raise your kids however you like? Most parents, I think, would probably say that this is an obvious right that they have. But isn't it an instance of imposing one's beliefs and one's will, one's opinion on someone else? A defenseless person who doesn't have any sense of reality or morality yet? Should a person be allowed to give their kid a silly name? Should a person be able to name their kid Hitler? Should a person be allowed to raise their kids believing that murder is okay? How about raising their kids to believe that the murder of just certain people is okay? How about raising one's kid not to believe in murder, but to believe that the oppression of certain people is okay? How about raising a kid to believe in the latent superiority of their race or religion or culture? Should a person be allowed to raise their child to believe 
in the rightness of their particular group's values over every other group's values. Don't we all do this? Don't we all get raised with this idea? Isn't it necessary in some ways to spread what we perceive to be the good stuff over what we perceive to be the bad stuff? Isn't it all kind of just a type of indoctrinization? Should we have the right to indoctrinate our children however we want to? Does this count as a personal freedom? Or is it us forcing our ideology on someone else and therefore impugning upon someone else's freedom to believe however they like? If we do not have someone in our lives giving us this base level of ideology, what would we believe? Again, these are very interesting and difficult thoughts to have. Societally, we do take some kids away from their parents, sometimes because of how they're being raised, despite their theoretical right to raise their kids believing whatever silly things they want them to believe, and however they want to do that raising. But how much do you have to beat your child before the government has a right to take that kid away from you? How much oppression can you teach your kids is okay and legitimate before that kid is taken away? This is something that's changed over the years. It's something that is different in every culture you go to. There are absolutely shocking things that one culture considers absolutely normal, but to me would be shocking. And the same thing would be true, no doubt, about how I was raised to some other people from other cultures. They would not be able to believe that I wasn't beaten as a child. How else do you keep your kids in line? Like, it's, it's a normal thing for certain cultures and a completely abhorrent thing to others. It's a normal thing for some cultures to teach their kids that their religion is the correct one and this other religion is the wrong, horrible one. To teach their kids that a certain group of people is the enemy. And this is a freedom that some of us have, and it's a freedom that is curtailed in some cultures, in some time periods, for various different reasons. But there's no absolute on this. And the reality is that most of us are indoctrinated and prone to being indoctrinated. It's just that the ideals that we're indoctrinated with, in a lot of cases these days, internationally, regardless of the specifics, are very liberal ideas, while others are restrictive. And I'm not using liberal in the political party sense here, but in the literal sense of the word. In the literal sense of the word liberal, it means open to new behaviors and willing to discard traditional values in favor of new ones, and with biases that favor the rights of the individual over group priorities. And this is kind of an overarching ideology that has taken over the world as we have spread democracy or democracy-like governmental systems, as the free market or the somewhat free market has taken over the world, as it's come to make more sense typically to trade with each other rather than declaring war on each other. These liberal values, again, in the literal sense, not the political sense, are what have allowed us to create kind of a global super society. Despite the fact that we have a lot of people believing a lot of different things, we are still able to interact with and deal with each other and respect at least some of the rights that each other have because of this shared ideology. Now, not every nation, not every society adheres to that type of liberalism, is not open to new ideas, is more likely to cleave to tradition is more likely to perhaps sacrifice for the greater good in a way that would seem insane to a lot of people in the liberal nations, are considered to be one part of a greater whole rather than a complete individual. And it's the conflict between those types of societies and the more liberal societies that we, that we do see a lot of the dominant conflicts today, because we are dealing with each other, we are sharing trade, and we are sharing land, and we are sharing resources, and we're sharing a lot. We're sharing a lot of culture with each other. But when we stray too far into that territory in terms of what rights to curtail and what rights to allow, which freedoms to exemplify and which ones to restrict, that's where we come into conflict. 
And that, to me, looks like the root of a lot of the issues that we're seeing today. The closer you look at this, or the closer I look at it at least, the more it seems that some ideologies are just seemingly incompatible or largely incompatible with those larger liberal ideologies. To many religious groups, to many political parties around the world, to many individuals, righteousness is dependent on exercising power over other people. It's not enough to be a good person yourself and to live a good life and to regulate your actions in a way that you consider to be moral, that fits with your philosophy, your ethics. In these cultures, to be morally correct, to be a good person, you have to shape your children so that they grow up a certain way. You have to keep maybe your wife dressed a certain way. You have to ensure that she plays her role just as you play your role. You, in some cases, have to ensure that your neighbors are walking a certain thin line. And if they step to the side, they have to be turned in, maybe beaten, maybe killed, maybe imprisoned. We've seen this in, again, different religious societies, different cultures, different political parties. You look at, like, the USSR. There were a lot of examples of this. That was a secular nation that had a belief that was likewise in some cases, incompatible with the ideology of liberalism. And almost every time you see these types of usually autocratic, but not always, societies or organizations or even small communities, they have a lot of trouble mixing and melding with those who are more liberal in that broad sense, and the same vice versa. Now, this whole perspective is... Perhaps, actually, probably, the consequence of my own biases, my own indoctrination. So is my opinion about the idea that is usually thrown about as the obvious solution for this problem. That solution that a lot of people toss about is the idea that we just divide people up. You live here, I'll live here, we won't have to deal with each other anymore. You can have your society that believes in these types of freedoms here, and I can have my society that believes in these types of freedoms here. This is an idea that makes sense in theory to a certain degree, but it doesn't work in a globalized world. It didn't even really work in past centuries when we were far less connected than we are now for a multitude of reasons, but it certainly wouldn't work now invariably at a certain point, one group will look across the border and need to control the other. Or one group will look across the border and feel the need to free the oppressed in another nation. Or one group will look across the border and need to spread their beliefs to that other group they see on the other side. Because their religion, or their political doctrine, or their societal philosophy demands it. And this is true whether we're talking about the spreading of Islam or the spreading of democracy. Despite all the flaws with these liberal systems of all shapes and sizes, I do tend to think that it's the best of all the systems that we've tried, because it does allow us to continue changing and to keep evolving, while other systems, which can at times allow for more control and potentially allow more to get done in a short period of time, It does limit us, though. It leaves us open to stagnation. It leaves us open to the abuse of one or a small group of people. So even if a system flourishes under a benevolent dictator for a time, there are always those who will suffer on the fringes. And the whole system could come toppling down when that particular dictator dies and another moves in. There has never been a perfect system, though, and what I consider to be the most evolution-oriented today still exists on one side of a very thin, very permeable membrane, with autocracy just on the other side of that line, within spitting distance. By enforcing certain freedoms, certain liberties, certain individual rights, we will almost always trample others in an equal and opposite fashion. That is the nature of this system. 
Now, will this always be the case? Maybe not. Maybe some advancement in theory or philosophy or society or technology will provide us with the means of sidestepping some of these downsides. Or the natural flow of things will reduce the overall number of oppressive absolutes, leaving more of us willing to focus on ourselves inwardly rather than trying so hard to force our own ideals and norms on others in order to feel successful and relevant. I think given today's technology and today's larger system, the democratic forms of governing tend to be the most likely paths to such a future because they leave more openness and more opportunity for evolution, even when some of the steps in between are malevolent mutations rather than beneficial ones. But we will see. There's a lot that can change, a lot that can happen. For the moment, I do hope that we'll start to see more awareness of this potential to overstep and to cross that line, particularly in groups that are doing their best to head in the opposite direction, away from autocracy, not realizing that in exercising their freedom to not feel threatened, they might accidentally destroy our journalistic system's ability to report the news or might abolish our satirist's capability to comedically address systematic flaws. Ideally, more people do feel safe and secure than not, but every step we take in this regard has consequences, and some of them are blindingly obvious if we look for them. But because it's so difficult to address the flaws within our own worldviews and ideologies, and perhaps because it would be terrifying to face how thin that line between where we stand and the polar opposite actually is, we are all too often, unfortunately, not even looking. This episode of Let's Know Things was brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is the hosting company I have used to host my blog and my author site and the site that I have for Let's Know Things, letsknowthings.com. I've used them for years and years. I've been very happy with them. They have excellent service, excellent customer support, wonderful prices, and those prices become even more wonderful if you go to hostgator.com slash LKT, as in Let's Know Things. They are offering a substantial discount to Let's Know Things listeners, so hostgator.com slash LKT to see those prices if you are on the market for something hosting related. This episode is also brought to you by Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT, you will receive a free month trial of Audible. And you can cancel that trial anytime if you do not like it. If you are like me, you probably will enjoy it and stick around, but you have nothing to lose if you do not enjoy it. And on top of that, you will get a free audiobook of your choice from their selection of a couple hundred thousand audiobooks. So they no doubt have something you will enjoy. I've got a bunch of my books on there if you care to listen to me a little bit more. But I'd also like to make a recommendation if you don't have something already in mind. There is a book called Furiously Happy, subtitle A Funny Book About Horrible Things. And this is a book by Jenny Lawson. It is, in fact, hilarious. And the narration of it, which I believe is the author, Jenny Lawson, is also hilarious. The entire book, I, I learned a whole lot about depression and things of that nature because the, the author herself deals with a lot of difficult psychological situations. But her coping with it, the way that she thinks about it and deals with it, and the way that she lives her life as a result, is amazing and interesting, and I think you'll enjoy it as much as I did. Just to give you an idea of the style of writing, because the style and the rhythm of her writing voice is just incredible, it's very distinctive. Here's a quote from the book's page on Audible. Quote, Some people might think that being furiously happy is just an excuse to be stupid and irresponsible, and invite a herd of kangaroos over to your house without telling your husband first, because you suspect he would say no, 
since he's never particularly liked kangaroos, and that would be ridiculous because no one would invite a herd of kangaroos into their house. Two is the limit. I speak from personal experience. My husband says that none is the new limit. I say he should have been clearer about that before I rented all those kangaroos. And so as you can see, it's kind of ridiculous and goofy, but it is also quite enjoyable and at times very educational all the way through as well. Furiously Happy, a funny book about horrible things by Jenny Lawson. You can grab that at your local library, your local indie bookstore. You can get it for your Kobo, your Kindle. You can also pick it up on Audible and hear it read by the author. And if you'd like, you can even get it for free by using the credit you get by going to audibletrial.com slash LKT. This podcast is supported by those aforementioned sponsors. It is also supported by its listeners. If you're keen to contribute in some way, shape, or form, you can go to letsknowthings.com. Scroll down a little bit, you'll see a bunch of different options. Everything from directly contributing a couple of bucks, you can set up a monthly payment thing, you can buy your Amazon stuff through the link that I give there. That gives me like a small affiliate fee without costing you anything extra. And you can also share the podcast with your friends or family, your podcast loving pets your social network. You can leave a review up on iTunes. Those reviews do help quite a bit in bringing in new people. And for everybody who's already contributed in some way, thank you so very much. It means a whole lot that you would spend some time and or money to help a stranger from the internet speak geeky things into a microphone each week. So thank you very much. If you are keen to grab one of my books, you can find a complete list of things I have written over at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. My YouTube show is on YouTube, and it is called Consider This. You can find me pretty much everywhere on the internet at Colin is my name. And you can find Let's Know Things, the show, which is actually also me controlling it, but under the guise of the podcast at Let's Know Things at Instagram and Facebook. If you'd like to check out the show notes for this episode or for any episode, you can go to letsknowthings.com. And you can also subscribe to the Let's Know Things newsletter while you are there. This is a free newsletter. It goes out each week on Monday, and it contains a collection of links to interesting things that I have read and think you might enjoy. Thank you so very much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week.